What's up, YouTube? Today we're going over oxygen requirements. Shout out to Antoine for that intro. Uh, today it's not private pilot information. You already know that stuff. We're going into commercial. Uh, go ahead and get out that notepad because our stuff that I definitely learned uh, doing this video that you're probably going to want to know for your check ride. Uh, anyways, thanks for tuning in. A uh, little tidbit on me, my check ride got pushed out yet again. That's all right. We're still crossing our fingers, keeping our head high, staying, staying uh, proficient. Anyways, uh, thanks for tuning in. I'll see you in there. Peace. Okay, bud. You ready to do some uh, mock roll on the supplemental oxygen requirements? Just the uh, that portion of the ACS. Yeah, absolutely. Let's get her done. Sweet. Cool. All right, let's get into it. Why do you think it's important for pilots to have the concepts of FAR 91211 supplemental oxygen requirements committed to memory? Uh, that's because AT generally has no idea whether my aircraft has supplemental oxygen or even what the 91211 regulations require, uh, meaning that ATC often issues climb instructions that pilots must be prepared to reject when flying aircraft that are not equipped with supplemental oxygen. Cool. During a day flight, you are told to climb to 12,500 and that you can expect to be at the altitude for the next couple hours. Can you accept? Legally, yes. Uh, the oxygen requirements are above type requirements, meaning that each additional restriction kicks in above the associated cabin pressure altitude threshold. So for instance, the requirement for the crew to use supplemental oxygen kicks in when flying above a cabin pressure altitude of 12,500 feet or more than 30, for more than 30 minutes. So 12,500 would be the highest VFR cabin pressure altitude permitted for operation without supplemental oxygen. Very good, very good. Okay, during a day flight, you're told to climb to 13,500 feet and that you can expect to be there for 15 minutes. Can you accept? Uh, again, you, legally, yes. Uh, as long as the time spent above 12,500 feet does not exceed 30 minutes. Good ADM would likely require an unable reply, though it, as it will take significant time to climb to 13,500 and descent back to 12,500, and the 15 minutes is just ATC's projection. Awesome, good job. How might your answers to the previous two questions change if you were flying at night? The legal answers to both would still be yes. However, the FAA recommends the use of supplemental oxygen at night when operating at altitudes above 10,000 feet during the day and 5,000 feet at night. Why so low for night flying? Mostly because night vision tends to degrade rapidly above 5,000 feet pressure altitude. Eyes use rods at night, and rods are much more sensitive to oxygen deprivation than cones, which we use to see during the day. Also, pilots are generally more fatigued when flying at night, and fl fatigue aggravates the effects of hypoxia. Specifically, what are the general supplemental oxygen requirements? Required to be used by the required flight crew above a 12,500 foot cabin pressure altitude up to 14,000 feet when at those altitudes for more than 30 minutes. Required to be used by the required flight crew at all times above a cabin pressure altitude of 14,000 feet. All occupants must be provided with oxygen above a cabin pressure altitude of 15,000 feet. Let's dig a little deeper. <clears throat> when you say cabin pressure altitude, do you mean that if you are operating with an altimeter setting below standard, say 29.72, uh, at a flight altitude of 12,500 feet MSL for more than 30 minutes, that you would be able to use supplemental oxygen because the pressure altitude of the cabin is above 12,500? Yeah. Sweet. Cool. Glad we got that established. All right, are the general supplemental re oxygen requirements for all aircraft or only those without pressurized cabins? These are for all. 
Um, if the cabin pressure altitude on a pressurized aircraft were to exceed 12,500 feet or more, for more than 30 minutes, uh, the required crew would have to use supplemental oxygen. Sweet. Take me through the supplemental oxygen requirements that apply to aircraft with pressurized cabins. The general requirements still apply. In addition, at least 10 minutes of oxygen supply must be available for each occupant for flights above flight level 250. Above, above flight level 350, at least one of the pilots at the controls must be wearing supplemental oxygen. However, there is an exception to this rule. If quick donning masks are available, as long as there are two pilots at the controls, neither needs to be using supplemental oxygen. This exception goes away above flight level 410. All right, cool. What qualifies as a quick donning mask? Basically, it's a mask that can be secured on the face with one hand and can start applying oxygen within five seconds. What is the major risk of flying at an altitude above 10,000 feet without using supplemental oxygen? A rapid or explosive decompression event, a pressurization system malfunction, or an oxygen system malfunction. Okay, so on a physiological level, what causes hypoxic hypoxia when flying at high altitudes without supplemental oxygen? The partial pressure of oxygen is so reduced at higher altitudes that when this low pressure oxygen gets delivered to the lungs, the lungs can't use it. The lungs can't transfer the oxygen from the ambient air to the blood to be carried throughout the body. All right, now what kind of symptoms can you expect from hypoxic hypoxia? Cyanosis, that'd be the uh, bluing of the fingernails and lips, uh, inflated sense of well-being or euphoria, headache, uh, decreased response to stimuli, increased reaction time, uh, impaired judgment and alertness, alertness, uh, visual impairment, drowsiness, lightheadedness or dizziness, sensation, tingling in the fingers and toes, numbness, and tunnel vision. Other than fatigue at, and night flying, what can aggravate the effects of hypoxia? Smoking, alcohol, drugs, poor physical fitness, or an underlying medical condition like anemia, certain other over-the-counter medications, as well as any situation that increases the body's demand for oxygen, such as extreme heat or extreme cold, fever, and anxiety. What are the three components of most oxygen systems? That'd be the storage system, containers most of the time, delivery system, masks, or na nasal cannulas. On a commercial airline flight, what type of oxygen delivery system would you expect the aircraft to provide for the passengers? That'd be continuous flow. Nice. Okay, what type of oxygen delivery systems uses the Dixie Cup? Uh, continuous flow. How does the system work? A continuous flow of oxygen is delivered into a rebreather bag. The passenger breathes this oxygen in through a nasal or oral cup or an airline drop-down unit, aka the Dixie cup. Exhaled air is then released into the cabin. Good job, okay. Continuous flow systems are considered effective uh, to approximately what altitude? 25,000 feet. Nice. You're cleared for a climb to flight level 350. What type of oxygen delivery systems would be necessary for the pilots? Diluter demand or pressure demand? Nice job. Describe how a diluter demand system works. Oxygen is delivered only when the user inhales, thus the demand part of the name. At lower altitudes, some of the supplemental oxygen that the user inhales is diluted with outside air. As the altitude increases, the oxygen becomes less and less diluted, eventually becoming 100% pure oxygen. Up to what altitude is this system considered effective? 40,000 feet. Nice. Okay, you're cleared up for a climb above flight level 400. What type of oxygen delivery system is necessary for the pilots? Pressure demand. Describe how this oxygen system works. The only difference between pressure and diluter demand systems is that pressure demand supplies the oxygen to the mask and lungs under pressure. 
This makes pressure demand safe to use above 40,000 feet, where 100% oxygen without positive pressure will not suffice. What type of oxygen are pilots required to use and why? Aviators breathing oxygen, because it abides by the aviators breathing oxygen purity standards, which requires at least 99.5% pure oxygen. During a free flight, how can pilots verify that the oxygen in the supplemental oxygen containers is aviators breathing oxygen? It'll be labeled as such. Why does the FAA advise against using medical grade oxygen? Because of the potential for water molecules that can freeze in low temperature environments and can clog the oxygen delivery lines. What precautions should be taken when it comes to servicing, handling, and storing oxygen and why? Not only is oxygen flammable, but it renders materials combustible that are normally nearly fireproof. Because of this, oils and greases should not be stored in the vicinity of oxygen, nor should they be used to seal the valves of fittings of oxygen equipment. Also, smoking during the use of or servicing of any kind of oxygen equipment is also strictly forbidden. When it comes to servicing the oxygen, the FAA advises marking the bottles with the recommended pressure, usually between 1800 and 2200 PSI before filling the tanks to that pressure level. What checklists can pilots use to ensure a proper pre-flight check of the oxygen system and describe it? Uh, for this one, we're gonna use the simple acronym PRICE, P-R-C-E. P for pressure, it's gonna ensure that there is enough oxygen pressure and quantity to complete the flight. R, regulator, uh, we're gonna expect the oxygen regulator for proper function. I, indicator, uh, we're going to ensure that the flow of the indicator shows a steady flow of oxygen when in use. Uh, next is going to be C, connections. Uh, it's going to make sure that all the connections are secured. E, it's going to be emergency. We're going to ensure sufficient oxygen for any emergency that might occur during the operation. This step should include briefing of the passengers on the location of the oxygen and its proper use. Very good, very good. All right, let's move on. All right, everybody, thank you for watching. I uh, hope it brought you a lot of value, got you ready for the check ride even more. Uh, go ahead and leave a like, comment, subscribe, do your thing. I'll be out with another video soon enough. I'm starting to like this editing stuff. It's, uh, it's getting easier and easier, but it uh, still takes a lot of time. Anyways, thanks for watching. See you next time. Later.